Hi everyone, welcome to the 36 Lessons of Vivek, as read by me. Sermon 1. He was born in the ash among the Velothi and on Chimer, before the war with the northern men. Iam came first to the village of the Nechemen, and her shadow was that of Boethia, who was the prince of plots. And things unknown and known would fold themselves around her, until they were like stars, or the message of stars. I am took a Nechman's wife and said, I am the snake-faced queen and the three-in-one. In you is an image and a seven-syllable spell. I am a seti avek, which you will repeat to it until mystery comes. Then I am through the Nechman's wife into the water ocean, where Druz took her into castles of glass and coral. They gifted the Nechman's wife with gills and milk fingers, changing her sex so she might give birth to the image as an egg. There she stayed for seven or eight months. Then Set came to the Nechman's wife and said, I am the clockwork king of the three-in-one. In you is an egg of my brother hyphen sister, who possesses invisible knowledge of words and swords, which you shall nurture until the Hortator comes. Then Set extended his hands, and multitudes of homunculi came forth, each like a glittering rope through the water. And they raised the Nechman's wife back to the surface world, and set her down on the, shore, the shoals of Azura's coast. There she laid for seven or eight more months, caring for the egg knowledge by whispering to it the codes of Mephala, and the prophecies of Veloth, and even the forbidden teachings of Trinimac. Seven Daedra came to her in one night, and each one gave the egg new motions that could be achieved by certain movements of the bones. These are called the barons of move like this. Then an eighth Daedroth came, and he was a demi-prince, called Fa Nuit Hen, with the multiplier of motions known. And Fa Nuit Hen said, Whom do you wait for? To which the Nechman's Nech wife said, The Hortator, Go to the land of Indoril in three months' time, for that is when war comes. I return now to haunt the warriors who fell and still wonder why. But first, I show you this. Then the barons and the demi-prince joined together, in a pillar of fighting styles terrible to behold. And they danced before the egg in its learning image. Look, little Vec, and find the face behind the splendor of my bladed carriage. For in it is delivered the unmixed conflict path perfect in every way. What is its number? It is said the number is the people of is the number of birds that can rest in an ancient tibral tree less three grams of honest work but Vivek in his later years found a better one and so gave the secret to his people for i have crushed a world with my left hand he will say but in my right hand is how it could have won against me love is under my will only the ending of the words is alm civi Sermon 1 is about the birth of Vivek. Nechman's wife is just some random unknown woman who would later give birth to the man-god. I am here is what they refer to Omalexia as. And Set is what they refer to Sothasil as. Sothasil is naturally still accompanied by his robots and homunculi. And homunculi, sorry. And he's also referred to as mystery. You will repeat until mystery comes. And Vex's original name was Vivek. Sorry, I have those backwards. Vivek's original name was Vec. So yes. The two other pieces of the tribunal came to Vivek's mother and made it a point that they knew that her child would be, you know, the Messiah, at least according to the 36 lessons. And that is what Sermon 1 is. Sermon 2. The Nechman's wife who carried the egg of Vivek within her went looking for the lands of the Indoril. Along the journey, many spirits came to see her and offer instructions to her son-daughter, the future glorious, invisible warrior poet of Vardenfell, Vivek. The first spirit threw his arms about her and hugged his knowledge in time. 
The Netchman's wife became soaked in the incalculable effort. The egg was delighted and did somersaults inside of her, bowing to the five corners of the world and saying, Thus whoever performs this holy act shall be proud and mighty above the rest. The second spirit was too aloof and acted above his station so much that he was driven off by a headache spell. The third spirit, named At Hatur, came to the Netchman's wife while she relaxed for a bit under an emperor parasol. His garments were made from implication of meaning, and the egg looked at them three times. The first time Vivek said, Ha! It means nothing. After looking a second time, he said, Hmm, there might be something there after all. Finally, giving Athatur's garments a sidelong glance, he said, Amazing. The ability to infer significance in something devoid of detail. There is a proverb, Athatur said, and he left. The fourth spirit came with the fifth, for they were cousins. They could ghost touch and probed inside the egg to find its core. Some say Vivek at this point was shaped like a star with its penumbra broke off. Others, that it looked like a revival of vanished forms. From my side of the family, the first cousin said, I bring you a series of calamities that will bring about the end of the universe. And from my side, the second cousin said, I bring you all the primordial marriages that must happen within them, each one. The egg laughed. I am given too much to bear so young. I must have been born before. And then the sixth spirit appeared, the Black Hands Mephala who taught the Velothi at the beginning of days all of the arts of sex and murder. Its burning eyes melted the... Its burning heart melted the eyes of the Nechman's wife. She took the egg from her belly with six cutting strokes. The egg image, however, could see into what it had been before in ancient times, when the earth still cooled and was not blinded. It joined with the Daedroth and took its former secrets, leaving a few behind to keep the web of the world from disentangling. The Black Hands Mephala put the egg back into the Nechman's wife, and blew on her with magic breath until the hole closed up. But the Daedroth did not give her back her eyes, saying this, God hath three keys, of birth, of machines, and of the words in between. Within this sermon, the wise may find one half of these keys. The ending of the word is Om City. Mephala is a Daedric prince, naturally one of the original tribunal of Morrowind. She's related to the Morag Tong as well. I think she's more or less the founder. She deals with murder, sex, and lies, naturally. And she was treated as the anticipation of Vivek. Just as uh, the other pieces of the tribunal were treated as anticipations. Kind of like a reverse reincarnation. Anticipations of the other false tribunal members. Sermon 3. Being blind, the Nechman's wife wandered into a cave on her way to the domains of House Indoril. It so happened this cave was a Dwemeri stronghold. The Dwemer spied the egg and captured the Nechman's wife. They bound her head to foot and brought her deep within the earth. She heard one say, go and make a simulacrum of her and place it back on the surface. For she has something akin to what we have and so the Velothi will covet it and notice if she is too long away. In the darkness, the Nechman's wife felt great knives try to cut her open. When the knives did not work, the Dwemer used solid sound. When those did not work, great heat was brought to bear. Nothing was of any use, and the egg of Vivek remained safe within her. A Dwemer said, nothing is of any use. We must go and misinterpret this. Vivek felt that his mother was afraid, so he consoled her. The fire is mine. Let it consume thee and make a secret door at the altar of Padhoni, in the house of Bo Boat Hia, where we become safe and looked after. This old prayer made the Nechman's wife smile and begin such a deep sleep that when Dwemeri Achnox returned with cornered spheres and cut her apart, she did not awake and died peacefully. 
Vivek was removed from her womb and placed within a magical glass for further study. To confound his captors, he channeled his essence into love, an emotion the Dwemer knew nothing about. The egg said, Love is used not only as a constituent in moods and affairs, but as the raw material from which relationships produce hour later exasperations, regrettably fashioned restrictions, riddles laced with affections known only to the loving couple and looks that linger too long. Love is also an often used ingredient in some transparent verbal and nonverbal transactions where, eventually, it can sometimes be converted to a variety of true devotions, some of which we yield tough, insoluble, and infusible unions. In its basic form, love supplies approximately 13 drops of all energy that is derived from relationships. Its role and value in society at large are controversial. The Dwemer were vexed at these words, and tried to hide behind their power symbols. They sent the Atronachs to remove the egg image from their cave and place it within the simulacrum they had made of Vivek's mother. A Dwemer said, We Dwemer are the only aspirants to this that the Velothi have. They shall be our doom in this in the eight known worlds. Nern, Lurkan, Riket, Fender, Kirt, Akat, Mara, and Junal. The secret to doom is within this sermon, and the ending of the words is Omsin. Sermon 3 is about the death of Vivek's mother and how she was then replaced with more or less a robot built by the Dwemer to appear to be her. The mention that the Dwemer used solid sounds is true. That's what a tonal architect is. The Dwemer used pure sound and things that generate sound to do a lot of work, which allowed them to complete projects that magic or mundane means couldn't alone. At the altar of Padhom is Padome, who is one of the primal mythopoeic forces in the universe. Boethia is both Boethia, but pronounced in, you know, this manner. And the things that Vivek says about love is very in character for him but it is also primarily to confuse the Dwemer, as you do. And the eight known worlds, Nern, Lacan. so all of those are written without very many vowels, but they are all the names of relevant gods. Lacan is Lorcan, or Shore, if you prefer. Raket is RK, who is also the name of a planet within Mundus. Thender is Stendar. Kinert is Kinnereth. Akat is Akatosh. Mara is just Mara. And Junal is Julianos. And yes, the planets in the Elder Scrolls share names with certain gods and the whole universe that you know reality is in is called Mundus Sermon 4 the simulacrum of the Nechman's wife who carried the egg of Vivek within it went back to looking for the lands of the Indoril along the journey many more spirits came to see it and offer instructions to its son hyphen daughter the future glorious invisible warrior poet of Vardenfell Vivek a troop of spirits called the Lobbyists for the Coincidence Guild appeared. Vivek understood the challenge immediately and said, The popular notion of God kills happenstance. The head of the Lobbyists, whose name is forgotten, tried to defend the concept's existence. He said, Saying something at the same time can be magical. Vivek knew to retain his divinity, he must make a strong argument against luck. He said, Is not the sudden revelation of corresponding conditions and disparate elements that gel at the moment of the coincidence one of the prerequisites to being, in fact, coincidental? Synchronicity comes out of repeated coincidences at the lowest level. Further examination shows it is the other power, the sheer number of coincidences, that leads one to the idea that synchronicity is guided by something more than chance. Therefore, synchronicity ends up invalidating the concept of the coincidental, even though they are symptomatic signs that bring it to the surface. Thus, coincidence was destroyed in the land of the Velothi. Then an old bone of the earth, 
rose up before the simulacrum of the Nechman's wife and said, if you are born to be a ruling king of the world, you must confuse it with new words. Set me into pondering. Very well, Vivek said. Let me talk to you of the world, which I share with mystery and love. Who is her capital? Have you taken the scenic route of her cameo? I have, lightly and in secret, missing candles because they're all on the untrue side, and run my hand along the edge of a shadow made from 103 divisions of Worth and left no proof. At this, the old bone folded into itself twenty times until it became akin to milk, which Vivek drank, becoming a ruling king of the world. Finally, the Chancellor of Exactitude appeared, and he was perfect to look upon from every angle. Vivek understood the challenge immediately and said, Certitude is for the puzzle box logicians and girls of white glamour who harbor it on their own time. I am a letter written in uncertainty. The Chancellor bowed his head and smiled fifty different and perfect ways all at once. He pulled the astrolabe of a universe from his robe and broke it in half, handing both halves to the egg image of Vivek. Yes, I know. The slave labor of the, cell, of the senses is as selfish as polar ice, and worsens when energies are spent on a life others regard as fortunate. To be a ruling king, I will have to suffer much that cannot be suffered, and to weigh matters no compass or astrolabe can measure. The ending of the words is Almsifi. The simulacrum of the Nechman's wife has more or less replaced the original, which is one of the concepts talked about in Morrowind, mantling. The idea that if you believe you are something, you are it. And that a reincarnation or copy can be the original. It's a very minor example of it, but... The popular notion of God kills happenstance means that there are no coincidences, just plans and machinations by a god. A god wanting to create something. An old bone of the earth is actually the name for the Elnofei, the primordial race that led to men and myrrh. You know, elves before elves. He melted into milk and Vivek then drank him. I'm not really sure what that means. I know that babies drink milk, but that's about all I've got for you. The Chancellor breaking an astrolabe in half is meant to imply that things will never be as simple as the machine show them to be, but also is a hint to the fact that Vivek is a being of two halves. Two halves not really the same, two halves of each his own. Sorry, my cat giving himself a bath. And of course, the ending of the word is still, and always, Almsivy. Finally, the simulacrum of the Nechman's wife became unstable. The Dwemer, in their haste, had built it shoddily, and the ashes of Red Mountain slowed its golden tendons. Before long, it fell on its knees beside the road to the lands of the Indorail and pitched over, to be discovered eighty days later by a merchant caravan in its way to the capital Veloth, and on Amalexia. Vivek had not been among his people all the days of his pre-life. So he stayed silent and let the Chimer and the caravan think the simulacrum was broken and empty. A Khmeri warrior, who was protecting the caravan, said, Look here, how the Dwemer try to fool us as ever, crafting our likeness out of their flesh metals. We should take to this capital and show our mother I am. She will want to see the new strategy of our enemies. But the merchant captain said, I doubt we will be paid well for the effort. We would make more money if we stop at Nurmok and sell it to the Red Wives of Dagon who pay well for the wonders made by the Deep Folk. But another chimer, who is wise in the ways of prophecy, looked on the simulacrum with disquietude. Was I not hired on to help you seek the best of fortunes? I say you should listen to your warrior then and take this thing to I am. For though manufactured by our enemies, there is something in it that will become sacred or has already. The merchant captain took pause, and then looked on the simulacrum of the Nechman's wife, and, though he always heeded the advice of his seers, could do no more than think of the prophets to me at Normuk. He though, that's a typo, he thought mainly of the Red Wives' form of recompense, which was four-cornered and good-wounded, a belly magic known nowhere else under the moons. His lust made him deny I am his mother. He gave order to change course for Normok. 
Before the caravan could get underway again, the Khmeri warrior who had counseled a passage to the capital threw his money to the captain merchant and said, I will pay you thus for the simulacrum and warn you. War is coming with the shaggy men of the north, and I will not have my mother I am at uneven odds with one enemy while tending to another. Nerevar, the merchant captain said, this is not enough. I am triune in my own way, but I follow the road of my body and demand more. Then Vivek could not remain silent anymore and said into Nerevar's head these words. You can hear the words, so run away. Come, Hortator, unfold into a clear unknown. Stay quiet until you've slept in the yesterday, and say no elegies for the melting stone. So Nerevar slew the merchant captain and took the caravan for his own. I am again here and refers to Amalexia, her old name before she was called. She's a sort of theocratic priest queen. And the shaggy men of the north are the Nords of Skyrim, naturally. For those who don't know, Morrowind had an extensive, extensive one that actually led to their first proper alliance one with the planet. Something masterminded by one nerd. Also recall that Dunmer don't exist at this point, and Kymer are still golden skinned. And what's more, the Dwemer can mimic and simulate flesh with metal. This apparently is just because they're just that talented. Sermon 6 You have discovered the sixth sermon of Vec, which was hidden in the words that came next to the Hortator. There is an eon within itself that, when unraveled, becomes the first essence of the world. Mephala and Azura are the twin gates of tradition, and Boethia is the secret flame. The sun shall be eaten by lions, which cannot be found yet in Veloth. Six are the vests and garments worn by the suppositions of men. Proceed only with the simplest terms, for all others are enemies and will confuse you. Six are the formulas to heaven by violence, one that you have learned by studying these words. The father is a machine and the mouth of a machine, his only mystery is an invitation to elaborate further. The mother is active and clawed like a nix hound, yet she is holiest of those that reclaim their days. The son is myself, Vec, and I am unto. Three, six, nine, and the rest that come after glorious and sympathetic without borders, utmost in the perfection of this world and others, sword and symbol pale like gold. There is a fourth kind of philosophy that uses nothing but disbelief. For by the sword I mean the sensible, for by the word I mean the dead. I am Vec, your protector, and protector of Red Mountain until the end of days, which are numbered 3,333. Below me is the savage, which we need to remove ourselves from the altar. Above me is a challenge, which bathes itself in fire and the essence of a god. Through me you are desired, unlike the prophets that have borne your name before. Six of the walking ways, from enigma to enemy to teacher. Boethia and Azora are the principles of the universal plot, which is beginning, which is creation. And Mephala makes of it an art form. By the sword, I mean the first knight. By the word, I mean the dead. There will be a splendor in your name when it is said to be true. Six of the guardians of Eloth. Three before, and they are born again, and they will test you until you have the proper tendencies of the hero. There is a world that is sleeping, and you must guard against it. By the sword, I mean the dual nature. By the world, I mean animal life. For the sword, I mean preceded by a sigh. For the word, I mean preceded by a wolf. The ending of the words is Almsivi.
To be honest, I don't understand what's going on in Sermon 6. Sermon 7. As the caravan of Nerevar now made for the capital of Veloth and on Amalexia, there came great rumblings from the oblivion. A duke among scamps wandered into the house of troubles, pausing before each scripture door to pay his respects, until finally he was met by the major domo of Merun's Dagon. The duke of scamps said, I was summoned by Lord Dagon, master of the foul waters and fire, and I have brought the penance of my seven legions. The major domo, whose head was a bubble of foul water and fire, bowed low so that the head of the Duke of Scamps became enclosed in his own. He saw the first pennant, which commanded a legion of grim warriors who could die at least twice. He saw the second pennant, which commanded a legion of winged bulls and the Emperor of Color that rode upon each. He saw the third pennant, commanded a legion of inverted gorgons, great snakes whose scales were the faces of men. He saw the fourth pennant, which commanded a legion of double-crossed lovers. He saw the fifth pennant, which commanded a legion of jumping wounds, looking to hop onto a victim. You shouldn't be he saw the sixth pennant, which commanded a legion of abridged planets. He saw the seventh pennant, which commanded a legion of armored winning moves. To which the Major Domo said, Duke Kauta, your legions, while mighty, are not enough to destroy Nerevar or the Triune Way. Look upon the Hortator and see the wisdom he takes to wife. And they looked into the middle world and saw, evaporating in a throng of thunder, of red war and chitin men, where destines take him further from our ways, the heat that we have wanted. And pray they still remember, where destined clothe the distance, glad in the golden east that we saw it now, instead of the war and repair of the oblivious vexure. A curse on the Hortator, and two more on their hands. The Duke of Scamps saw the palms of the Hortator, upon which the egg had written these words of power, Gartok Padhome, Gartok Padhome. The ending of the words is almsay. In this, two demons discuss their plan to take down Nerevar. The big fellow's head is just a bubble that contains water and fire, and so when he leans down and puts someone else's head into it, they can share memories. And the penance are just various armies that the Duke of Scamps commands. I'm very interested by a bunch of just sapient wounds that want to become a part of a victim. And a winning move that is armored. Sermon 8 And presently, Nerevar and Brevec were within sight of the capital, enough. and the four corners of the House of Troubles knew it was not time to contest them. The caravan musicians made a great song of entrance, and the eleven gates of the morning hold were thrown wide. Iam was accompanied by her husband's state, a flickering, a flickering image that was channeled to her ever-changing female need. Around her were the shouts, a guild now forgotten, who carried with them the whims of the people, for the Velothi then were still mostly good at heart. The shouts were the counselors of Iam in the country, though sometimes they quarreled and needed set to bring them into usefulness. Iam approached Nerevar, who was now adorned in the flags of House Indoril. He gifted her with a simulacrum of the Nechman's wife and the egg of Vivek inside. I am said to Nerevar, Set who is Azura has revealed that war is come, and the Hortator that shall deliver us will approach with a solution what walking at his side. Nerevar said, I have traveled out of my way to warn you of the deceit of our enemies, the Dwemer, but I have learned much on my journey and have changed my mind. The Nechman's wife you see at my side is a sword and a symbol, and there is a prophecy inside. It tells me that, like it, we must for a while be like he is and as a people cloaked in our former enemies, and to use their machines without shame. At which Vivek spoke aloud, Boethia, who is you, wore the skin of Trinamac to cleanse the faults of Veloth, my queen, and so it should be again. This is the walking way of the glorious. Set appeared out of a cloud of iron vapor, and his minions made of their blood a chair. He sat beside I am and looked on the rebirth of mastery. Vivek said to them, his triune, My rituals and ordeals and all the rhymes within, 
use no other motive than the revelation of my skin. I am said, I am I seti I vec. We are delivered and made whole. The diamond of the black hands is uncovered. Why walk in the light? Set said. Wherever he treads, there is invisible scripture. To which the shouts were silent in sudden reading. Vivek then reached out from the egg, all his limbs and features, merging with the simulacrum of his mother, gilled and blended out in all of the arts of the star wounded east, under water and fire and in metal and in ash, six times the wise, and he became the union of male and female, the magic hermaphrodite, the martial axiom, the sex death of language and unique in all of the middle world. He said, let us now guide the hands of the Hortator in war in its aftermath, for we go different and in thunder. This is our destiny. The ending of the words is Almsivi. In Sermon 8, Vivek is finally born and merges with the Dwemer-built body of his mother. This is why Vivek is both male and female. He's hermaphroditic because his male-born body merged with a female body. Prior to the 36 Lessons writing, I'm not sure what the reason was. It might just be genetic mutation. That does happen in the real world. Intersex people are very common. The other two parts of the tribunal recognize that Vivek is the missing piece that they've looked for. And they look to Nerevar to guide them from this. And they also look to guide Nerevar. Sermon 9. Then came the war with the Northern Men, where Vivek did guide the Hortator into swift and tricky union with the Dwemer. The greatest demon chieftains of the frigid west were those below, five in unholy number. Hoaga, the mouth of mud, who appeared as a great bearded king, had the powers of marshalling and breathing the earth. On the battlefields, this demon would often be seen on the sidelines, eating the soil voraciously. When his men fell, Hoaga would fill their bodies back with it whereupon they would rise again and fight, albeit slower. He had a secret name, Fenya, and destroyed 17 Khmeri villages and two Dwemeri strongholds before turning away. Chemwa, the running hunger, who appeared as a mounted soldier with full helm, had the powers of heart roaring and sky sickening. He ate the Khmeri hero, dress Kizumet E sending the spirit back to the Hortator as an assassin. Sometimes called First Blighter, Kemua could give Cloud stomach aches and turn the reign of Veloth into bile. He destroyed six Khmeri villages before he was slain by Vivek and the Hortator. Bog, the two-tongue, who appeared as a great-bearded king, had powers of surety and form change. His raiders were small in number but ran amok in the west hinterlands, killing many Velothi trapper and scouts. He fell into a great debate with Vivek, for the warrior poet alone could understand the northern man's two-layered speech, though Amsivi had to remain invisible during the argument. Barfok, made of plains, who appeared as a winged human with lick-encrusted spear, had powers of event denouement. Battles fought against her would always end in victory for Barfok, because she could shape outcomes by singing. Four Khmeri villages and two more Dwemeri strongholds were destroyed by her decision enforcement. Vivek had to stuff her mouth with his milk finger to keep her from seeing Veloth into ruin. Ismir, the dragon of the north, who always appears as a great bearded king, had powers innumerable and echoing. He was grim and dark and the most silent of the invading chieftains, though when he spoke, villages were uplifted and thrown into the sea. The Hortator fought him unarmed, grabbing the dragon's roars by hand until Ismir's power throat bled. These roars were given to Vivek to bind into an ebony listening hand, which the warrior poet ba placed on Ysmir's face and ears to drive him mad and drive him away. The coming forth and the driving away brings all things around. What I say next is unpleasant to record. Hermamora Altadun, Ay Altadun. The ending of the words is Amsevi. Sermon 9 describes the war with Nords. Historically speaking, Nerevar made friends with Dwarf King Dumak, the king of the dwarves, and that was how their alliance began. 
in the 36 lessons Vivek guided him the whole way. It's not clear if that's canon or if Vivek made it canon retroactively. But because Vivek can warp reality, it's not clear what happened or if all of them happened. All of these warriors described here are Nords, and many of them have the ability to shout. Barfok, made of planes, can sing. She's using the voice, as seen in Skyrim. She can shout. Vivek stuffing her mouth with his milk finger is something I don't understand. It might be his penis. It might just be his hand, but I'm not at all sure. Hoaga is actually called Hoag Merkiller. It's unclear what breathing the earth means, but considering the following line mentions that he eats soil, it might literally mean that he consumes dirt. He has the ability to control it as well, which is why he puts it in the bodies of his men, filling them with dirt to send them back into the battlefield. Kemua appears to have the ability of soul trapping and was able to change the weather, something that Dovahkiin is able to do in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Bog the Two-Tongue has a binary mouth. He has two tongues, which means he's able to speak twice. What that actually means is unclear, but due to the binary nature of Vivek, he's the only one able of understanding Bog. Ysmir is the Ysmir mentioned in Skyrim, Wolfarth. When Nords call out to Ysmir, this is the one they refer to. He's a mythological figure who is also a piece of history, the Dragon of the North. And naturally, of course, he has a very obvious ability to shout. It appears as though Vivek put a pot on his head which caused all of the shouts to echo into his own ears. They then mention Herma Mora, which is the name for Hermaeus Mora among the Skalds, primordial Nords. Sermon 10. You have discovered the 10th Sermon of Vivek, which was hidden in the words that came in the aftermath to the Hortator. The evoker shall raise his left hand empty and open, to indicate he needs no weapon but his own. The coming forth is always hidden, so the evoker is always invisible, or, better, in the skin of his enemies. The island of the kingdom shall fill thirty and six folios, but the eye shall lead the world. By this, the Hortator needs me to understand. The sword is an impatient signature. Write no contracts on the dead. Vivek says unto the Hortator, remember the words of Boatia. You die. You will die. We pledge ourselves to you, the frame maker and the scarab. A world for us to love you in. A cloak of dearth to cherish. <laughs> Betrayed by your ancestors when you were not even looking. Hori Magnus and his ventured opinions cannot sway the understated. A trick worthy of the always satisfied. A short season of towers. A rundown absolution. And what is this? What is this but fire under your eyelid? Shift thee in your skin, I say to the Trinomach eaters. Pitch your voices into the color of bruise. Divide ye like your enemies and houses, and lay your laws in sequence from the center. Again, like the enemy, the corners of the house of trembles, and see yourself thence as timber, or mudslides, or sheets of resin. Then do not divide, for it is in the stride of Sisythesis, quicker than the rush of enemies. and he will sunder the whole for the sake of a shield. For we go different than in thunder. Sithisit is the start of all true houses, built against stes... You will die where you stes stes and lazy slaves. Turn yourself from the elections, broken like fall. Move and move like this. Quicken against false fathers, mothers left in corners weeping for glass and rain. Stasis asks merely for nothing, for itself which is nothing as you were in the eight everlasting intersections. Vivek says unto the Hortator, remember the words of Vivek. Understand that Sithesis still travels. Vivek says unto the Hortator, remember the words of Vivek. In a phosphoref phosphorescent mirror of the sky. Vivek says unto the Hortator, remember the words of Vivek. 
round and smiling. Vivek says unto the Hortator, remember the words of Vivek. Intermittent hopes enough. Vivek says unto the Hortator, remember the words of Vivek. To answer all of the things, Vivek says unto the Hortator, remember the words of Vivek, not yet queried. The ending of the words is Omsivi. Sermon 10 describes that Vivek thinks the Hortator, Nerevar, should listen to him. He refers to Boethia and then reminds everyone of the god Magnus. For those who played Skyrim, this is the Magnus mentioned in the Eye of Magnus. He's one of the gods that helped shape the world, and he's the reason that we have stars. Sithisid is presumably Vivek's word for Sithis, more commonly known as the god of the Dark Brotherhood. Sithis isn't exactly a god, more like the divine lack of one. But to read all of the things that Vivek says into the Hortator, remember the words of Vivek, without that in between every line, it is, Understand that Sithis still travels in a phosphorescent mirror of the sky, drowned in smiling, intermittent hopes enough to answer all of the things not yet queried. Sithis is still moving, using what may or may not be a star. Hopefully, it'll be enough to answer all of the things not yet asked. Asked. The deck also calls to the people to not divide. And if to divide, to divide properly. This one also has several typos and misspelling. The eyelid of the kingdom shall fill thirty and six folios. That refers to the six lessons of thirty-six lessons of Vivek. It's meant to say 30 and 6, because that's the old way of writing 36, but it says 30 instead. A folio is just a collection of paper. There's a mention of a cloak of dearth. This is either a typo or combination of dirt or earth. It's something that describes the world. A world for us to love you and a cloak of dearth to cherish. Presumably this is calling to Lorcan, who created the world, depending on who you ask. And then stasis is spelled... Status, rather. I'm not sure what that's supposed to be. It's either status, but it's spelled with an I instead of a U-S. Status? Status? Or it is stasis, but spelled with a T instead of an S. Stasis versus status. I do not know what it's supposed to be. These were the days of Resdania, where Chimer and Dwemer lived under the wise and benevolent rule of the Omsivi and their champion, the Hortator. When the gods of Veloth would retreat into their own to mold the cosmos and other matters, the Hortator would at times become confused. Vivek would always be there to advise him, and this is the first of three lessons of ruling kings. The waking world is the amnesia of dreams. All motifs can be mortally wounded. Once slain, themes turn into the structure of future nostalgia. Do not abuse your powers or they will lead you astray. They will leave you like rebellious daughters. They will lose their virtue. They will become lost and resentful and finally become pregnant with the seed of folly. Soon, you will be the grandparent of a broken state. You will be mocked. It will fall apart like a stone that recalls it is really water. Keep nothing in your house that is neither needed or beautiful. Ordeals you should face unimpeded by the world of restriction. The splendor of stars is I am's domain. The selfishness of the sea is sense. I rule the middle air. All else is earth and under your temporal command. There is no bone that cannot be broken except for the heart bone, and you will see it twice in your lifetime. Take what you can the first time and let us do the rest. There is no true symbolism of the center. The Charmat will believe there is. He will feel that he can cause years of exuberance from sitting in the Hagrid, sacred, when really no one want? can leave that state and cause anything more but strife. There is once more the case of the symbolic and barren. The true prince that is cursed and demonized will be adored at last with full hearts. 
According to the codes of Mephala, there can be no official art, only fixation points of complexity that will erase from the awe of the people if given enough time. This is a secret that hides another. An impersonal survival is not the way of the rule of king. Embrace the art of the people, and marry it. And by that I mean, secretly have it murdered. The ruling king sees another in his equivalent seat rules nothing. The secrecy of weapons is this. They are the mercy seat. The secrecy of language is this. It is a mobile. The ruling king is armored head to toe in brilliant flame. He is redeemed by each act he undertakes. His death is only a diagram back to the waking world. He sleeps the second way. The Charmat is his double, and therefore you wonder if you rule nothing. Hortator and Charmat, one and one, eleven, is an inelegant number. Which of the ones is more important? Could you tell if they switched places? I can, and this is why you will need me. According to the codes of Mephala, there is no difference between the theorist and the terrorist. Even the most cherished desire disappears in their hands. This is why Mephala has black hands. Bring both of yours to every argument. The one-handed king will find no remedy. When you approach God, however, cut them both off. God has no need of theory, and he is armored head to toe in terror. The ending of the words is all in It is unclear what Vivek means by this completely. At the time of the Dwemer's existence, Alm Sivi, the tribunal, did not exist. The Dwemer had a hold of the artifact known as the Heart of Lorcan, and that is what caused the Dwemer to disappear. At least it is theorized, and very likely, that it had something to do with it. Vivek and the rest of the tribunal only got a hold of the heart after the Dwemer disappeared, and they used the heart to ascend to Godhead. We know this to be completely true, which means that it's impossible that Alm Sivi existed at the time. However, because of Vivek's power of retroactive godhood, he made it so that he was always a god. It's unclear if he just writing the story as though he was always a god, or if he changed history. When Tiber Septim became Talos the Ninth Divine, he did retroactively change the world in history, and it's why Cyrodiil, as seen in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, is not a jungle or rainforest, as it's mentioned to be in a few books. And what's more, when seen in the Second Era in the Elder Scrolls Online, one can tell that this is in fact a retroactive change. Talos made it so that Cyrodiil was always like it is today. So, perhaps Vivek was always a god, but only after he wasn't. Here Vivek again describes how he was the guide to the Hortator, the guide to Naravar. The waking world is the amnesia of dream is partially a reference to how being awake will make you forget your dreams, and partially a reference to how all of the world of the Elder Scrolls is in fact the dream of Anu, uh, the great over-god. and how motifs and ideas in a dream can become real, and so can become wounded. Keep nothing in your house that is neither needed or beautiful is just good advice. There is no bone that cannot be broken except for the heart bone is a reference to the heart of Lorcan. Some describe earth bones as immutable parts of the world that cannot be moved, except they can and have been. The third of the world is one of them. The giant ivory tower in Cyrodiil is another. The red mountain is one as well. These things are more commonly called towers. And the red mountain is the red tower, partially because it contains the heart of Lorca. Vivek telling Nerevar that he will see it twice in his lifetime, well, in your lifetimes, plural, is how Nerevar initially sees it after the disappearance of the Dwemer, when he is presumably killed by the Tribunal or Dagoth Or. And seeing it the second time is a reference to the final boss of Morrowind. There is no true symbolism of the center. When pared down to its most base things, the world is as the world is. The Charmet will believe there is. Dagoth Ur believes that there is more to things sometimes. This is partially why he's trying to imprint himself on Anu's dream. 
there are several things that one can do with a Heart of Lorcan. And I once described the world as though Anu made a canvas and the divines put paint on it. Lesser gods like Vivek is merely changing the paint, while stronger gods like Tiber Septim, when he became Talos, are adding their own paint. Dagoth Ur is erasing the canvas, burning little holes in it with a cigarette. Of course, it's all up to interpretation. He will feel that he can cause years of exuberance from sitting in the sacred. This is a reference to how Dagoth Orr spends most of his time near the heart of Lorcan, growing strong from it, bonding with it, and becoming a piece of it, really. And his death is only a diagram back to the waking world is reference to the philosophical concept of Chin, which may or may not be one of the realizations Vivek has had, that he's in a video game. Some of the things described by Vivek when he speaks about Chim imply that he has the ability to use console commands, save, and load. And this is another reference to it. Hortator and Sharmat being compared is how Vor and Dagoth and Indoril Nerevar were very good friends, and how Dagoth Or invites the Nerevarine to be friends with him again. If you would only lay down your weapons... We could greet each other as friends, is the message she passes to him via Dagoth Gares. And he again prompts Nerevar to lay down his weapons. It is not too late for my mercy. He says that they are a one and one and become an eleven together. It's an inelegant number because it's prime, I believe. And as for how they switched places... If Vorin Dagoth was the one talking, and if Nerevar had Dagoth's job, the world might not be very different, but for some very subtle, simple things, specifically in relation to the Nerevarine and Dagoth Ur. If Indoril Ur was fighting, presumably, the Vorinarine, the world would be in a much different state, but that isn't very obvious in the days of the First Era. Where would you like to go? Even the most cherished desire disappears in your hands. When you approach God, cut your hands off is something that's played around with in Coda, C0DA, um, a comic book that Michael Kirkbride wrote. Michael Kirkbride is the author of Morrowind and Some of Oblivion. And Coda is more or less a sequel to Morrowind. The main character, Jubal, cuts his hands off and instead gains something called ghost hands, which allows him to touch things that aren't there and speak to things and do a lot of other things that don't make a lot of sense, much like the 36 lessons. Coda is less allegorical, but still just as confusing as some of its counterparts. Cutting off his hands and gaining ghost hands may also have been a part related to achieving Kim or Chim. I've only ever read it, to be perfectly honest with you. The one-handed king finds no remedy as how somebody who will only consider one point of view will only have that one point of view. And so when presented with anything actually perilous or resembling a dilemma, will be in a bad situation. Sermon 12. As the Hortator pondered the first lesson of ruling kings, Vivek wandered into the morning hold and found that Iam was with a pair of lovers. Set had divided himself again. Vivek then leapt into their likenesses to observe, but he gained no secrets he did not already know. He left behind a few of his own to make the journey worthwhile. Then Vivek left the capital of Veloth and wandered far into the ash. He found a span of badlands to practice his giant form. He made of his feet a less dense material than the divine to keep from falling waist deep, deep into the earth. At this point, the first corner of the House of Troubles, the Prince Molag Ball, made his presence known. Vivek looked on the King of Rape and said, How very beautiful you are that you do not join us. And Molag Ball crushed the warrior poet's feet, which were not invulnerable, and had legions clean him off, cleave them off. Mighty fires from the beginning place were brought to, like, nets to hold Vivek, and he let them. I would prefer, he said, some kind of ceremony if we are to be married. And the legions that took of the feet were summoned again and ordered to prepare a banquet. 
Pomegranates sprang from the badlands and tents were raised. A throng of Velothi mystics came, reading the passages of the severed feet on the ground and weeping till the scriptures were wet. We must love each other briefly, Vivek said, if at all. I am needed the counsel of the Hortator in more important matters, because the Dwemeri high priests stir up trouble. You may have my head for an hour. Molag Ball rose up and extended six arms to show his worth. They were decorated in runes of seduction and its reverse. They were decorated in the annotated calendars of longer worlds. When he spoke, mating monsters fell out. Where must it go, he said. I told you, Vivek said. I am meant to be a teacher of the king of the earth. I aldun gartak padhome. With these magic words, the king of rape added another, chim, which is the secret syllable of royalty. Vivek knew what had what he needed from the Daedroth, and so married him that day. In the hour that Baal had his head, the king of rape asked for proof of love. Vivek sh- spoke two poems to show him such, but only the first is known. I'm not sure how much glass it took to make your hair. Twice as much, I'm sure, as the oceans have to share. Hell, my sweet, is a fiction written by those who tell the truth. My mouth is skilled at lying, and its alibi a tooth. The sons and daughters of Vivek and Molag Bal number in the thousands. The name of the mightiest is a string of power. Gulgamor Jil Hayat Aihum. The ending of the word is Amsi. Sermon 12 first describes Nerevar thinking about the lesson that Vivek has told him. In this, Hortator is not referred to as Nerevar because he's meant to be an allegorical character. The reader is meant to be the Hortator here. Vivek is speaking to you, the reader, just as he does the Hortator. Vivek, the author, is using this book about Vivek, the poet, speaking to Hortator allegorically. One can imagine a likeness between Dante Alighieri, the poet, and Dante, the character from Dante Alighieri's poem. Vivek went to Mornhold, which is the area where Amalexia can be found in the Elder Scrolls III Tribunal, Morrowind's first DLC, and finds that I am, recall that that's Amalexia's name, is with a pair of lovers. Set, and again, so the Sil, had divided himself. Amalexia and Sothasil are having sex, Sothasil having split himself into two to give Amalexia a threesome. Vivek reads their minds, left through their likeness to observe, but doesn't learn anything he doesn't already know. He duplicates himself and joins in, while the real Vivek leaves. He found a span of Badlands to practice his giant form. That is, Vivek, you know, becoming a giant, using his godlike power to make himself larger, as you do. He made of his feet a less dense material than the divine to keep from falling waist deep into the earth. The world of the Elder Scrolls may or may not be the giant dead body of a god, hence the divine, and he makes his feet of a certain material so that he can stand on it without sinking in. Molag Ball appears and crushes Vivek's feet. His warriors then cut the feet off. Vivek instead appears to take it as some sort of a flirt and asks to marry him. Molag Ball's army appears again to set up a little wedding. Vivek and Molag Ball pretty much have sex here. That's about it. And the sons of daughters of Vivek and Molag Ball number in the thousands. This is an impossibility. Daedra cannot have children, and they cannot breed. They're something more of creatures of destruction than of creation, and so they cannot have children. But what's more, they're not biologically compatible with anyone from Nern. There is no instance of a half Daedra child unless an already extant child was corrupted by a Daedra. But that's not really, you know, a true sire of a Daedra. It's very unclear what Vivek means by this. 
speak, Traveler. That's the first 12, and I'll cut it here because I've been talking for quite a while. We'll do the next 12, and then presumably the next 12 in the third episode. Because there are 36 of these. And a secret 37th. I've been Alfred, and thank you for listening to me drone on and on about this. This is the 36 Lessons of Vivek, Sermons 1 through 13. I don't know a lot about these, other than what they say. That's very hard to glean anything from. Knowing a little more of the exterior makes it a lot easier on me, but it's still very difficult. So, have a good day. Let's hear it. 